It's time to rename some board games. Welcome to Tabletop Shop. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Tabletop Shop Podcast. I am your host, Cody Pennington, seated around the globe from myself in an infinite, unyielding loop. These are some strange times at Tabletop Shop, for, as you may recall, we used to have another host on this show, the formerly credible Nathaniel J. Clark, until, of course, the infamous Rosalski scandal of 2023. For those unfamiliar with these events, during a routine board banter segment, the aforementioned Mr. Clark neglected to include Scythe on a list of top games based on artwork, a list on which he included such titles as Abyss and Raiders of Scythia. When questioned about the decision to omit Scythe, a game that was number three in Clark's 2022 Top 100 Games, and a game which owes its existence to the globally recognized art by Jacob Rosalski, Mr. Clark is reported to have made the following statements. And I quote, I felt like it wasn't part of my gameplay experience that much. To me, this game at this point is just a puzzle, and I don't even notice the art anymore. It's not a number six, but it's not really on the list either, so it's kind of this weird, like, it's in its own thing on the side. An anonymous source indicated that when off the air, Mr. Clark stated that he had in fact forgotten about Scythe when considering games for this list, but instead of amending his rankings, he chose to fabricate a reason for not including Jamie Stegmeier's 2016 bestseller on his list. Note that Scythe is the recipient of four Golden Geek Awards, one of which was for artwork and presentation. However, I was recently informed by Mr. Clark that he may be willing to issue a public apology for his actions. We actually have Mr. Clark as a special guest on the show today. Uh, Mr. Clark, can, can I call you Nate? <laughs> uh, Cody, if, if this is what you want to hear, you can have my letter of resignation by next week. Uh, that, 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 hey, that's not what you said last time we spoke. You indicated you're ready to issue a public apology. I don't know if I said I would apologize. Did I say I'd apologize? You you did. You did. Okay. Um, I M apolog Mr. Clark. Wait, Mr. Clark. Do you recognize, <laughs> do you recognize that you yourself have affirmed that Scythe is the game responsible for committing you to this hobby and that Jacob Rosalski is the artist responsible for committing Scythe to existence and as such, you would not be the gamer you are today without the artwork of Scythe? I feel like this is turning into, like, somehow I insulted him personally, all right? Uh, I, would I mean, like... I'm not saying I got an email from him or anything, but I'm also not not saying that. <laughs> um, okay, I will say I apologize for my negligence while putting my list together, but at least I did it, like, beforehand instead of right before we recorded the podcast. So you do publicly apologize for not including <laughs> Scythe on the list then? Yes, I do, Cody. All right, yes. all right, all right. Okay. I feel like I'm in a corner. So, okay, here's the thing. I've discussed this eventuality with the board, and they agreed that at this juncture, Mr. Clark, Nate, we can reinstate you as a co-host of the Tabletop Shop podcast. Of course, this does mean that you'll have to take the newly established oath of office. Is this is this acceptable <laughs> to you? Um... Well, why do I feel like there was a right answer for an opinion-based list? I've, I'm getting that vibe. I don't. I don't know if the listeners are also getting that vibe. But uh, sure, I'll take your oath. Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, please, Mr. Oath. Clark, please, please settle down, Mr. Clark. Yeah, let's I, stay on topic. I, I right? will. I will draw your attention back to your previous statement off the air from from an anonymous source, of course, that you had forgotten about Scythe when considering this list. So Scythe should have a, a placement in the top five. All right, I'll take your oath or repeat your oath or whatever it is you want me All to right, do. Excellent. excellent. So please place your right hand on your heart and your left hand on your cranium, <laughs> representing that this hobby demands both your heart and your cranium. Believe it or not, I'm actually doing it. Excellent. Great. Now look to the east where the euro was born. 
and rest your feet on the floor, home of the Ameritrash. Yeah, okay. I presume you are doing this now. Excellent. It's a bit of an awkward angle with my microphone, but yeah. That's all right. I, I'm i honestly just impressed that you know where East is. So well, we're good, you don't we're know good that I do. You just know that I'm not speaking directly into my microphone. If, you least, if you're looking somewhere, that's fine. It all wraps around the world at some point. All right. Now, Nathaniel J. Clark, do you commit to recognizing good games and good game art as much as it depends on your subjective experience? If you do, say, Zemoim Zichim. Which is Zem- Polish for with my life. <laughs> Zemoyem zichim. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah you got it. it. Okay. <laughs> Do you commit to providing the listening hobbyist your honest, unadulterated opinion so that they can live their best gaming lives as much as it depends on your subjective experience? If you do, say Zemoyem zichim. Zemoyim Zichim. I'm sure you're pronouncing that. Are you pronouncing that right? Am I pronouncing that right? I used Google Translate and it told me that's oh, how you say wrong. it. So okay. yeah, yeah. And also there, there's definitely no connection between that we're speaking Polish here and that Jacob Brzezowski is Polish, but you know. Yeah, despite my apparent hatred for him, I already put that together. Yeah, 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 yeah. And finally, do you commit to embodying the concept that just as the creator has made you, so do you have the responsibility to create quality content? If you do, say Zemoyim Zichim. Ah, yes. Zemoyim Zichim in the language of the Creator. Got it. Then now, once more, do I call you brother and welcome you back to Tabletop Shop. That's Nate Clark, everybody. Give him a hand. My left arm is killing me from being up on my head that whole time. Hey, but it was worth it. You you got through the oath. Uh, Everything's fine now. Everything's great. Okay, well, I mean, I guess there's no, like, fancy intro. This is what we're going to talk about today. I guess we can just skip that. Um, Yeah. Do you want your question, Cody? Do you want your question of the day? I feel like we don't really need one, but, you know, just... Since you're recently reinstated, I'll give you that. Sure, go for it. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, dude. All right. Do you think... Do you think 5G is actually faster, or did they just slow down 4G? And do you believe in a conspiracy involving telecom companies and the U.S. federal government? I can also, if you want, I also have a board game question. If you'd rather, I have both. I can do, I can do either. It's up to you. I would prefer a board game question. Board, it's, as, okay. Well, yeah, yeah, let's do a board game question. All right. Pertaining uh, top, to the, to the third component of your oath, which was to create quality content. <laughs> yeah. It's great to follow it up with that, isn't it? Oh, that's a real <laughs> question, by the way, but uh, let's move on. Okay, <laughs> okay. Topic, topic of the week is Scott Alms. All right. So yeah. here's, here's your dilemma, Cody. You can have either all of the tiny epic games or you can have heroes of land air and sea with everything thrown in all expansions upgrades whatever you name it everything all right you can only have one of those options what are you taking (sighs) does this include all potential tiny epic games that he produces let's say up to date up to date which is like maybe there's 10 maybe there's less i'm not 100 percent sure but here's the thing i have not enjoyed the majority of the tiny epic games that i've played but even having played like four or five of them i know i've probably only played like 20 percent of how many there actually are so okay. i'll i'll take a chance and i'll stick with the tiny epic games that's fair so you've been burned continuously but yet you're willing to throw yourself back into the fire well you know there's like one and a half games i still enjoyed and here's the thing i would get really tired of uh heroes of land air and sea if that's all i had by itself whereas that's, if i had a variety yeah. of game styles from the tiny tiny epic games like that's pretty nice honestly like if it was me deciding i'd go with the same choice but i just in general i didn't enjoy heroes that much anyways so ah uh, yeah it, it was okay it was a game but we neither of us have had that much experience with 4x games also yeah also true i don't think right have you played many others no not really okay yeah same well i mean i feel like it's fair that you had your whole long spiel because i'm I, do you have any new games to talk about cody uh nope no i'm good right. i i almost <laughs> so didn't but no. actually i got one played this afternoon okay hey, brand, brand okay. new game absolutely oh, Okay, again, game. I don't know if that's necessarily the right word. Have you heard of the the Exit the Game series? Oh, yeah. I've, okay. I've played a few of them. Oh, yeah. Okay. What, what are your opinions on them? Hmm. I feel like I never do as well at them as I feel like I should be able to do. Because sometimes there's just some little hidden clue or twist of logic that was like, 
either uh how did i not get that or like serious like we had to do that to figure that out yeah yeah but that... beyond that it's it's not like you have to replay them it's just a single experience each time that was generally my experience as well it was kind of like there were a couple puzzles that were like a good level of difficulty. There were some that were way too easy. And there were some that were like, never would I have ever <laughs> guessed, like put those pieces <laughs> together to do that. It seems like, you know, like the most random thing. So it just felt like a lot of guesswork. And it took us like 90 minutes. And yeah, not, not really a fan, I have to say. Uh, yeah. So I feel like they can be... A little bit lacking in the the practical experience or the, the thematic connection because it's like why why are there three digit locks just everywhere throughout the world <laughs> like what is going on here okay that's i wonder like if there's also if i wonder how unique each game is also because this the one we played the mysterious uh, museum or something oh um, i did yeah we did that one yeah it was all just like you're just trying to find three number combos because you have this like rotating cipher and uh-huh. I saw an, at least there's at least one, maybe two others that have the same cipher in it. And it's like, like, are the games really all that original from one another? I don't know. And I feel like I'm not willing to take the chance on another one either. So, yeah, l- let me point you towards the unlock or yeah, unlock. I've heard about series? that as well. They're a little yeah. bit better. I've played a, a few. Of there's like Star Wars Unlocked and it comes with like three different games in the box. Yeah. And th- those are actually kind of cool. They come with an app. And there are even some puzzles in the app where you get to pick up the phone, almost like Chronicles of Crime, and like look at it or mm-hmm. look through it. So yeah, it's pretty well, cool. And I, if I remember correctly, those ones are also reusable. Like obviously you can't redo it if you've done the mystery, but the exit games you're like literally folding and tearing stuff. So yeah. like you, can, you just throw it all away afterwards. Um, I believe unlock you could like play through it and then sell it secondhand. Yeah. So at least you're passing the joy around and. Not losing all your money. Not just like throwing everything away after one use. So yeah. All right. Um, well, that's that. That's our shortest that segment's ever been, yet still somehow way too long. And uh, let's move on to our game of the week. All right, take it away, Cody. Hey, no, no, th- this is you, bro. It's well, welcome back. You can start introing segments again. But no, I mean, like that, that was my intro. My intro was take it away because I feel like you have to explain the game. Ah, dang it. Well, normally you're like, and our game of the week is, oh, yeah, we didn't do that since, since we were so preoccupied in the whole beginning of the, the episode with this, the scandal that we had to discuss. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't do the like our game of the week is this. So, OK, Nate, our game of the week is Knit of Valir. What, you you saying I have to explain how the game works? This is Cody. like the third or fourth time in a row, bro. Yeah, all I'm saying is you got to pick, you gotta start picking my games instead of your games, man. Okay, fine. Well, wait, did I pick this one? I we have picked no idea. these so long ago. Who, yeah. who even knows anymore? <laughs> it's been on the schedule for a long <laughs> okay. time. We'll agree, whatever the next game is, if it's one that only I like know better, we'll switch it to something that you know the best. Bueno. And you can explain it. Bueno. All right. Uh, Knit of Valir. This is a basically set collection game card drafting uh bidding not really auction mechanic but but there is bidding you're jockeying for position um over three different little taverns that are set up that are filled with dwarves so three three taverns per round and you have some some little coins that you're wagering between those three taverns to try to get first pick each time and it's fairly simple how the game scores there's just five different classes of dwarves and they all score in different ways one of them is like the more of them you have it increases numerically how much you score the other one is how many of them you have you score exponentially one of them is just face value and so forth and so forth yeah it's very yeah, creative it, it'll be, hey hey <laughs> the what's what's creative is the bidding mechanic because you've got these coins that's the other cool thing about the game and I, we're already talking about what's cool about it but really i'm just explaining how it works is these coins that you're bidding every time that you you go through a round, you have the opportunity to flip over a zero coin, which then lets you combine whatever your two left out coins are, because you have five coins total, and then you swap out the higher number for the new sum. That's a bunch of math, and it probably doesn't make sense hearing it, but basically you can slowly upgrade your coin pouch into stronger coins, and those stronger coins are going to let you have 
more likely the first pick um, for each round or for each tavern that you're bidding on. But you also get the face value of those coins in points at the end of the game. So if you can convert your coins better, you're going to get more points, which is fun. <laughs> it's a good way to How'd end I the do? review. Or an explanation. Thanks, an explanation. Good way to end that. Yeah. All um, right. So our board banter is... <laughs> That's all you need to know. Uh, yeah. I'll launch right in here with the good, with the good. Um, I like the aesthetic of the game. I wouldn't necessarily say I like the art. And we might have talked about this last episode because I think it was on your list of our top five art. But um, the aesthetic is cool. It's black and white. And then you have the other colors that that pop a little bit because the because the rest of the game is black and white. Um, I like that okay. I think it, I think it works well. Um the actual dwarf art, I'm kind of like, I think it's a little ugly, but it's not terrible. But then there's also a handful of repeat art throughout it too, which in a way it's like, okay, I get it. Like not every single piece of art has to be original and unique, but uh, it's just a little thing. Um, hmm. So th- there's that, but that, you know, that's, that's minor. Um, I really, the best part of the game, far and away, the best part of the game is the bidding the bidding mechanism? Um, it's actually quite quite brilliant that you have these five coins. You use three of them to bid with, and if you used your worst coin, you can upgrade one of your like you use your other two coins to upgrade. You know, it's a very that in general. The bidding in general, like the blind bidding, is kind of fun, not necessarily unique in and of itself. But then that upgrading mechanism, you know, blended in with it creates for a really interesting dynamic because pretty much Mm -hmm. every round almost everybody's using that upgrade token which is worth zero so you're not going to win you have no chance at winning basically wherever you bet it but then you get to upgrade a coin so it's a good pros and cons thing again i think i've said this a million times i'll say it again one of my favorite things in board games if not my favorite thing as a general idea is give me pros and cons to my decisions Mm. right yeah and that is a good that's a good one right there Especially because people are doing it most of the time, you know? And then you have to decide which other coins. If you use your best coins to upgrade, you're using really bad coins to, to bet with. So mm-hmm. it's a great dynamic. I love that. Um, I like that there's a lot of special cards, especially when you throw the expansions in. There's even more. There's a plethora of these special cards that you can get maybe, you know, like four, three or four of throughout the game. Maybe more. Uh so I like that, and there's a ton of options, an overwhelming amount of options, and a ton of some, you know, symbology too when you're first playing the game. Um, and it's also relatively quick. It plays well at two, it plays well at four, and no matter what, it's pretty snappy too. So, all those those are all those are all my goods. Those those are all the things I enjoy. Hmm. All right, let let me hit you up with my goods before we we start trashing the game, which I I know you certainly will. <laughs> I assume because we're not talking about expansion content here, unless you want to. We can mention it as a side note, like we did with Viticulture, but let's try and stay on course. All right. So I like the vibe of the game. I'm going to start trying to use that a little bit more than I use aesthetic, because I feel like the vibe also kind of communicates it's how all the artwork works in tandem with each other to give you a certain like, feeling or yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, aura. But, yeah. Aura. aura. You could use aura as well. An aura. A little bit. Ooh, that's a another mystical. good one. We- we need to get a little sticky note where we just start writing these down and then we'll just kind of flip through them each time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, the game has a great aura. I I know Nate isn't a huge fan of the art necessarily, or at least it's just kind of neutral for him. Um, and I, I also agree with the aspect that there are repeat dwarves within the, the given categories. And, yeah, that would have been nice if they're all, all unique. Maybe not necessary, but it would have been nice. But besides that, I like how... Most everything is in black and white, but the categorization, categorization, nailed it. The little banner that tells you what what class a dwarf is, um, those are colored. So it kind of has this cool appearance of everything's black and white, but then it's just speckled here and there with little pops of color. And I don't know, it just it it works for me. It works. I do like that there's different paths to victory. Too, it seems like every game you can approach it with a generally similar strategy or maybe how you're going to go about it but there there are definitely are different paths like are you going to focus really try to go for getting all the green cards and get those uh exponential scoring or are you going to 
try to switch over and try to take as many red cards as you can. So, because if you get the most red cards at the end of the game, you can also score your highest coin twice, which can be pretty powerful. Or are you just going to grab those already high scoring blue cards that, that don't do anything else? But really where the differing paths also comes in is within the all the heroes. There's the neutral heroes and then the colored heroes that can fit in in your classes of ranks with all the dwarves. It's just really cool how they all interact with each other. There's so many of them. I don't like, I mean, I've played Nidavli a fair amount of times. I really don't think I've gotten anywhere near to like playing with every single hero. Mm -hmm. Some of them are definitely yeah. stronger than others. And it just kind of depends what scenario you are in in the game. But it's pretty cool how those can switch things up and make it, make the game a little bit different every time. Um, and finally, I mean, you already said it, so I'll just piggyback off of it. But I, I do love the coin system. I like how you have to decide uh, which, which coins am I going to combine this round. Because if I try to combine my two biggest coins and get one big coin out of it, I'm then just bidding with all my low coins for that actual round. So maybe if you're coming into a round where you really don't care about most of the picks, maybe choose that time to try to upgrade your biggest coins. But otherwise, maybe you maybe you don't even care about doing a conversion. Maybe you already have three good coins and you just want to win every round. You just play all those and you don't even have to do a coin conversion that round. So yeah, it's just cool. It, the, the math works out in, in interesting ways, especially because when you combine your two coins, you don't trade in the lower coin, you trade in the bigger coin. So you're actually limited to a, a coin increase to whatever your lowest used coin is at a given time it, it just has these interesting little patterns that kind of branch off from it yeah that's how i feel about it also dude. i i felt that within just the base game there were times where i didn't care what came up and so i was like okay i can invest in upgrading a coin this time and just use my bad ones for bidding i felt like with the expansions thrown in it was it was far less frequent that i was like eh i don't care i'll take what i get you know hmm. so just a little side, a little expansion, expansion note. Yeah, especially for the second round, because all those cards were always like really strong, at least for the first couple of turns. But then, yeah, and then, but at the beginning of the first round, you have the special ones. So anyways, yeah, expansion talk, save it for ah. something else. All right. Um, let's, let's just talk about the scoring, man. I mean, I think we have different perspectives on this. But the scoring is like the most unoriginal. It's it's so boring to me. It's so boring. I mean, two of them are literally just counting. It's like, how many banners do you have? Well, okay, how many points do you get for that many banners? You know, And sure, they scale different. So like there's a different approach for purple or green. But mm -hmm. in general, they're just counting, you know? And then you have blue, which is just straight up face value points. And then you have orange, which is like just numbers times banners. So it's just multiplication. And then you have red, which again is just face value points, but then there's something that you're working towards towards the end goal. Red is by far the most interesting one because it's just face value, but then whoever has the most banners gets a you know a big scoring bonus basically at the mm -hmm. end of the game. Um, so that's something kind of something kind of different. Everything else is just plain Jane, you know, no offense to anybody named Jane, but it's really <laughs> Does not does not vibe with me, Cody. It just doesn't work for me. All right, it's it's. I wish they I th they could have definitely done something more interesting, and I w I wish they had. Hmm. Um, and then in in general, the game and again we're just talking base. The game is just card drafting and set collection. And again, we're like the the bid the bidding mechanism. I love. Everything else is so basic. It's just like collect cards, get sets. How many points do I get? You know, and. Again, I, 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 I'll i say it again. I love the bidding mechanism. And it, it gives some spice into the game that without it would be a complete miss. Like 100% miss. I would never touch it, you know? But because the bidding mechanism is fun, it kind of equals out the rest of the game for me. So. Hmm. That all you got? Nothing else you, you want to trash? I, I feel like... Well, also the coin stand up is stupid, but I don't know if there's necessarily a better solution <laughs> if you're using coins. Like it has uh, this like chintzy little like bleachers that you put all the coins in. Yeah, you know? it really is like bleachers. Yeah. Um No, I mean I feel like my 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 hate tanks are pretty empty for this game because I've just I've done it so much <laughs> over the podcast that it's like yeah, I still feel how I always felt. And I you know as a, a meriting factor, I will say that with both the expansions thrown in, the game is definitely better. 
with without them it's like i can get through a game but like ugh, you know hmm. yeah for me the scoring mechanism that doesn't really bother me that much i agree that it's not particularly ingenious i suppose at least for each specific class for how they score because i know there's a lot of set collection games and they can score kind of similarly but the thing is, even even if how they individually score is simple, the scenario is never simple. That's what is the puzzle to me. It's like, okay, um, especially early in the game when you don't really know how it's going to end up. Like, okay, I could take this red card. I'd really rather try working towards getting a bunch of green as much as possible. But there is that first era like evaluation that if I get more red, then I could get this extra little thing. And it, it's actually the... It's the case for that for each individual class of dwarf. But then beyond that, as you're getting kind of to the mid game and then towards the end of the game, you're really coming down to trying to run the numbers of like, oh, dang, okay, so I could take one more purple or, oh, I could really hope and wait for that yellow to come in or, oh, actually, that's the other thing I just forgot. This is just another like. It's not just even about individually scoring dwarves. It's once you get a complete set of five different colors, that's how you are able to draft the heroes. So it adds this additional layer to it where you're not just concerned about the individual scoring. You're also trying to diversify and get equal amounts of everything. So you have to decide where to min-max. And Roy Kennedy would love it because of that. I'm sure he's already played it and he loves min-maxing things. I think Roy, that's... let me know in the comments how you feel about this. <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's fair, um, and it is a it is a good dynamic of wanting to invest in certain things, but having to also have a broader perspective and be collecting everything. Um, part of me wants to try to only invest in like two columns and see, mm. like, so not trying to get any of the special cards by collecting sets of five, and just focus on like two columns and see how it goes. My guess is that I'd get blown away, and I would never try it again. But I could be wrong. <laughs> you never know. I mean, worth the try. Like, if you could play multiple of these games back to back, maybe without the expansion, I'd probably that die. Really, I'd just actually go extends die. the game. <laughs> That's so sad. Well, uh, here I'll I'll heap coals onto this fire of death of shame uh, for the dislikes of the game, uh, which for a game that is pretty high up there for me, like. I want to say Nid of Lear is like in my top 20, my top hundo list, which I know Nate would would scoff with disbelief <coughs> and aghastness. Yeah, give me another scoff. <coughs> uh, that, was, that was okay. You can work on that. Uh, for, for it being so high, I do have a couple complaints about it. I really dislike, you called it the coin stand. I think it's the treasury is what it is. The little bleacher setup. It's not just the bleacher setup, it's that it's constantly falling apart, like it sort of <laughs> clips together, but nothing actually sticks. So if you kind of pick it up and move it, like the bottom stand starts sliding out. Well, you could glue it. Nobody's stopping you, you. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. You don't have to disassemble it to store it. But the whole thing is still so flimsy. Like when I'm putting it away and I'm storing the game, I'm like taking care to not stack do any you, cards on top of the thing. Do you store that game sideways or do you uh, store it horizontal? um because i would i would be the one like i store all my games vertical try to anyways yeah, yeah and i like i know if i owned that game i would put everything in and i would go and i would put it in vertical and i would accidentally put it with the bleachers like on the bottom and i would just hear oh, this like crunch, crunch and everything would just smash it and just know oh, that would happen dude. here's the thing i think i do store it vertically but i haven't experienced the crunch yet maybe i just do it perfectly every time i'm sure you do so, yeah, the treasury, I mean, yeah, it's a good point. I don't know how else you really would do it, but I, I wish there was something, some other innovative way to display all the coins. Because it's kind of annoying to set it up every time, too. You have to separate. There's like two or three copies of every upgrade coin that you can acquire. And you have to go through Castles of Burgundy style and like put each one down. So, yeah, there's that. The other thing is... The game doesn't actually scale incredibly well for more players. I know some games, obviously, you're going to score more or less points, depending on if you have more or less players. But this game, it's not just that you score less points at the end of the game when you're playing with more players, just, just due to the competition. But the deck stays the same size. So you play with all the cards in the deck, whether you're playing with two players or whether you're playing with four players. So if you're dividing that by four people instead of two, there's actually going to be less rounds to play through for the draft, which means there's less scoring opportunities. And so I kind of just wish the deck was a little bit bigger. I mean, if all the cards are kind of the same anyway, just like put more cards in there and then 
you can always do like four or five rounds in a four player game. Couldn't that also affect your strategy? Like two, three, four, you know you're getting a different amount of cards. So couldn't that change how you approach the game too? I guess that's, yeah, that's true. But I'm the kind of guy that I love the solo aspect of games. I don't like solo games, but I like doing my own thing in games to where I'm always trying to get a PR, like I want a personal record. So because of that, yeah, it would be a bit of a different challenge or a well, different puzzle just winning, but I, I still want a big score. You just, have, you just have PRs for different player counts, and two is you know always going to mm. be the highest. That's true. It's tedious to track, though. It is. That's tedious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, my dislike is for the hero stands, the, the little plastic card stands that you put all the heroes on. For one, you have to line them all up oh, nice and yeah. perfectly. But as soon as you reach over the table, like maybe you're reaching over the table just to grab one of the coins off the treasury and then you accidentally barely tap one of the heroes and it knocks over the entire stand and sends them all flying the thing is it's the thing is like they didn't have to include those you could just lay them out on the table right so like they chose to include Mm. something to try and make it easier to see the cards Uh, any other game would have just said lay them all out on the table flat right so yeah i guess it makes it easier for people to see unless they're oriented a certain way and then everyone who's behind the cards can't see them at all so yep i don't know (laughs) all right all that to say there's some cons but i still very much like this game i think you know if as a gamer you know what you like and you like drafting and you like set collection go for it why not you know um just not for me i'll just say that i'll put it nicely it's just it's just not for me so and that's cool. It's it's good, Nate, receiving your honest and unadulterated opinion so that all the, the listening hobbyists can live their best gamer lives. Listen, and hey, it's okay to like a game, all right? It's okay to like a game. Even if one or both of us doesn't like it, like, it's just an opinion, you know? If you like Era of Kingdoms, go play Era of Kingdoms. If you like Anno 1800, please, by all means, play it. Play it like, just because one or both of us doesn't like it has, should have yeah. really no impact on whether or not somebody else likes it so yeah i mean there's a caveat like if we're all at a board game convention and you see us and you you come over and you try to start playing arid kingdoms with us like you're gonna get slapped that's all that's I'm just gonna not say. gonna work yeah <laughs> you get out of there <laughs> all right um let's let's move on to our board banter and mm. this was as you said cody because of your strange introduction to this episode we did not have a normal a normal we've, been, we've done it for a few episodes we didn't have my intro And so, but you directly alluded to this in your intro before my intro, before the pre intro. -intro. Yeah. So we're going to name some more board games. Our way, the, the, not way brothers, tabletop shop style. (laughs) I'm getting my different (laughs) entities confused. Yeah. You know, we we haven't, oh yeah, dude, way brothers. So classic. I I got distracted thinking about what I'm about to say now. Yeah, I can tell. Now I realize that you said Way Brothers. Yeah, that was cool. No, I I was just thinking that we haven't really repeated many board banters before. I suppose the only repeat has just been doing like a a designer spot. Yeah, just just the concept of it. But this this was one of my favorite board banters that we've done, Uh which is what board games or card games should be titled. And I'm excited to do a part two. I am also excited, Cody. Um, So let's start. Are we going alphabetical? I I arranged them like last time where I put my five and then your five. Ah, that's right. Okay. Um, why don't you lead us off then? Because I arranged them alphabetical and yeah, it'll be easier okay. for you to go first and I'll just follow. So I'll just read and different... you'll tell me what you got? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Because even though we had so much trouble last time trying to decide that this is not a numbered list and yet we have to number each one so you know how many we've done so far. It's true. So that we'll, we know. We'll say, yeah, we'll say number one, we'll say number two, but we're not saying that these games are better or worse than it's each a list, other according to that but it isn't yeah okay so the first game it's not number one it's the first <laughs> game that we need to rename aries expedition all right yeah so, so i'm so, gonna hit you up with oh what no i was just i gonna ask who goes first but you, you can go ahead i think what we did last time is i went first for the games i picked and right. then you went first for the games you picked i think so let's Sounds do good. that all right aries expedition Oh, look, everyone picked the same phase again. (laughs) Oh, that's a good one, actually. I respect that pick. We just played this game recently, and it was like... We did. Yep. It was like... I don't... don't, It was a four-player game, and I don't think we ever had one where everybody picked a different one. No, it was kind of sad. Although we didn't finish the game, so we could have had one. That's fair, and also sad. 
Yeah. Okay, Ares Expedition for me. I would rename this Terraforming Mars, the even more card game. <laughs> because I, True, though. I, I'm a strong believer that Terraforming Mars is basically just a card game and they there's some board interaction, there's some stuff that happens, but it's like 90% a card game, maybe higher. I do want to get a card count of how many cards there are in TM versus AE. Can I, we call it AE or are we just going to say Ares Expedition? I think it's pretty close. You can say whatever you want, Cody. I think it's pretty okay, close. Right. And actually, I think it's funny that they didn't name it the card game, even though that's basically what it is. I wondered if they just wanted to avoid any flack because then they yeah. made the dice game specifically. Yeah. And this one is the card game, but they didn't call it that. So I just thought it was Well, funny. here's the thing about the marketing for that. If they had called it the card game, I probably would have been like on top of this a lot earlier. But whenever I heard Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition, that just blended in with my mind of Venus Next and uh, Turmoil, like all the different expansions. Yeah, just, I just thought it was another right. Terraforming Mars expansion. Right. I'm sure a lot of people were confused by that. But I think they learned, and now it's Terraforming Mars, the dice game that's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> or already out. It's already out, right? Oh, it is? I what? Think so. I think so. Is it good? Well, I haven't We, well, we got to do the classic it, stop and check it out. Terraforming at Mars. At least um, Kickstarter editions have been delivered, at least. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, rank? Oh, okay. 5,000. I was expecting like 8,000. <laughs> well, it's also it's still I, pretty I know that's new. still terrible. It's pretty new still, so you can't even judge it by the 5,000. You can definitely judge it by the cover, though, because that's Oof. kind of a dumb cover. A rough. And the dice are ugly. <laughs> yeah, that's sad. Well, right. anyway, how about we move on to our second game, Seven Wonders Duel. I'm excited to see what you got. I All I got was, you better not take that card, bro. <laughs> Mine, Cody, mine's basically the same. Oh, no, I, what well, you got? It's different, but it's the same. <laughs> okay. uh, I said, so, you like to hate draft? <laughs> that would be like my sales pitch for Seven Wonders Duel. Like, so That's do you like good, to dude. hate draft? That's I've good. got the game for you. Yeah. Can we market this somehow? Can we get like t-shirts printed or posters where we like take our taglines, but then put them up in the font that the title would be? Oh, that is a great idea, Cody. That, at least as fun. at least as like posters, kind of like mock board game covers. Yeah. But also t-shirts or whatever. That's I like that idea. Hey, hey someday we'll have merch. Let's make that the first merch idea. That'll be a great moment. We'll have to go back and listen to these episodes to get the <laughs> titles again. It'll be a sweet moment, Cody. Yeah, I like that. But then here's the thing. Are we going to have like two copies of each t-shirt? Or not Not two copies, but like we're going to have your tagline and then a different t-shirt no. with my tagline? Or are we going to agree here's on which one is better? No, we'll post a vote because this is in the future where we have a huge Ooh. fan base. You just post a public vote. I love that. There you go, Cody. I like that. All right. And easy marketing too because we know what people are going to buy. <laughs> well, we know what a certain percentage of people are going to buy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, our third, our number three, seven, nope, that was someone, we just did seven wonders still. It, it's all mixing up. Our number three is Furnace. Um, I, I thought for a little bit about this one, and I got, who says a game needs more than one mechanism? <laughs> it, what do you mean? It has two. Yeah, well, it, it actually does, like, have a couple, but the thing <laughs> is, if, if, if you take, comparatively, if you take Terraforming Mars, that probably has, like, 27 mechanisms, like, when you break it all down. So a game having like three actually is pretty tiny. Okay. I guess it sounds like you would say a game needs one more than one mechanism, but that's all right, Cody. But it's, you, you, people, the people know. All right. For mine, I had to do a bit of a throwback to one of our older episodes. And actually, if listener, if you listen to our most recent or no, uh, our, our, our anniversary episode, I think it's two episodes ago at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this will be fresh in your memory. Um, I titled it furnace welcome to hell <laughs> okay dude i totally wanted to do that but i just didn't think many people would get it i know well, that's why i had to preface it otherwise people would be like what and now what? they're still like what but now maybe they'll go back and listen to the anniversary episode so okay dude i totally want a t-shirt it just says that <laughs> just furnace. we're gonna need a good graphic design artist uh i'll hit up andrew bosley he's got us He's a good he's, artist. He's I, don't know if he does, I don't know if he does graphic design, but all right. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. Uh, all right. Next up, we have Citadels. Really doesn't matter if you're doing the 2000 or the 2016 edition. It's, it's all the same. Either way, mine is everyone hates the assassin. <laughs> Cody, we think so. We think so similarly. <laughs> oh, no. I thought the silence was just unimpressed. No, no, no. We think so. We think so similarly. All right. Mine is? for Citadels, I would just rename it Past the Assassin. 
Because I don't remember how it is how it works out exactly because I haven't played it in a while. But it's like whoever goes latest gets to like pick again at the beginning of the first round. So it's like no, nobody's ever the assassin twice in a row. If mm-hmm. if somebody else wants to take it, and it feels like the most powerful card anyway. So it's like somebody takes it every single round anyway. Yeah. But then sometimes it's like every round one card gets discarded blindly and no one knows which one isn't in the game. Yes. And sometimes that could be the assassin. Yes. But hey, I mean, if you're the second person to draft and you're looking at the cards and there's no assassin there and you're like, oh, dang. yeah, you're like, now I take the worst card so I don't die. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't die. Yeah. Yeah. All right. OK, we, we need to we need to get some different ones up here. I, I'm confident we'll be different in this one. Legends of Andor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fun for at least three games. <laughs> and then why is it not fun afterwards because <laughs> it's just you, you play the campaigns and you're like yay and then it's, you're done i would even say it's just like every scenario feels the same as the one before it basically like Kinda, there's different just, objectives but in general i feel like you're doing the same thing every time until you're playing the dragon you have to roll like perfectly every single time just yeah. to survive so if you get lucky that's fun um so for me legends of andor i would rename it legends of generica because it is like the <laughs> most uncreated, like there was no effort put in whatsoever to like create a world. It was just like, just like copy and paste Lord of the Rings content and just edit out the trademark stuff. It's like mm. carbon copy, nothing original. Yeah. Not a fan. Yeah. Here's the thing. Now that there's a TV series called Andor, I feel like Disney's going to start punching up in Legends of Andor. Disney's gonna name. start punching up on Legends of Andor. I don't. I'm not yeah. really sure how to interpret that. That's a real phrase. In a Disney's good way. Gonna be like, you can't have that name because we have Andor, and we're gonna make our spinoff board game called Legends of Andor. <laughs> Maybe they'll name it Andor Legends, Cody. Come on, give them give them <laughs> a little bit of credit. Andor Scrolls Legends. Yeah, it's good. Oh, jeez. Okay, let's just move on to my list. All right, uh, uh, that was your five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right, my first, first one. Now. My first one is Azul, and I would just say this one's more of a description. Yeah, it's like sometimes it's just a description, sometimes it's a quote, sometimes it's renamed, whatever. Yeah. For Azul, I would say pretty, pretty boring. Uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, you probably don't agree necessarily with my sentiment, but I appreciate well, it. Well. The, okay, here's the thing. This is a gateway game that I don't mind pulling out. Okay. Most gateway games, I'm like, uh, yeah, I, I, I only keep it in my collection so I can play it with people who've never played games before and I want to start teaching them the games. Azul is one that I actually tolerate and still kind of enjoy while playing. <laughs> tolerate. Such, a, such an endearing word. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, it's not really a gateway game either. Like, it's gateway entry level, but it's... It doesn't really teach any common mechanics to people other than drafting, maybe. Yeah, but the drafting's so funky that, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's different. All right. Mine was, who needs a theme anyway? So true. So true. Yeah. Obviously, they didn't. Like, They're pretty I, successful. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a theme. You're like tiling a floor or a wall or something. Yeah, but, but there's no, theme and then there's theme. All right. So let's yeah, let's keep them yeah. separate at least. <laughs> you can keep your dumb abstract games. All right. Uh Castles of Burgundy. I'm guessing we'll have something similar on this one, you know. I, I bet <laughs> something that stands out. Uh I would rename Castles of Burgundy an interactive experience in board game maintenance. <laughs> that's, that's good. It almost has like a second punchline when you think about it more. You're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. My Mine relates, but it's one hour of setup enters, 10 minutes of gameplay leaves. <laughs> also true. Yeah. Not just that. Yeah, it's like setup, takedown, and maintenance. It's just yeah, brutal. It's all, brutal. But I didn't want to say one hour of setup, maintenance, and takedown <laughs> enters because that's kind of long. Yeah, it's not as good. It doesn't have quite the ring to it. So good thing Although, you're in charge. What, when it comes down to the vote, maybe we can make that the third option for the t-shirt. I don't think it's going to win. All right. It's funny. I don't. Do you think we've ever mentioned Castles of Burgundy on this podcast without also mentioning that aspect of it? Oh, it's impossible not to, bro. I feel like there's some games where, like, like also like with Nina Valera, I feel like that's never been mentioned without me like saying how I hate a certain aspect of it. I feel like there's yeah. a few games where like something always comes up every single time, like Air of Kingdom. You, you can't say like 
This reminds me of the trade route expansion in Era of Kingdoms, <laughs> that garbage piece of crap. <laughs> also, I don't remember how the trade route expansion works, so I would never say I don't that. either. All right. It was like a mini expansion. It, it just came with the Kickstarter, I think. Yeah. No, no, it, it just adds more cards to choose from, but it's it still didn't really fix the problem of all the cards being the same. Well, it definitely did not fix the problem because it didn't replace the cards. Yeah. All right. My next one, Spirit Island. This one I would rename The Beautiful Beast. Because hmm. it's I we talked again, it was on my list uh last episode for top five art. And because it is I think I think it looks really good and I love the art in it. Mm-hmm. But man, is it a heavy game. It is uh I mean, wow. Like, first of all, you have to learn how to run the game. If you're lucky enough to play with somebody else who knows how to run it, it still breaks your mind. And then if you also mm-hmm. have to like juggle kind of running everything while playing, it's just it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. This game hurts. And that's why my title is, I've never had this much fun losing a game. <laughs> <laughs> Probably did true. We, also. Did we win? Did we win that first game we played? I think we did. But it went so long. It was like over two. Uh, there was like four of us playing at least. It was it was long. Yeah. 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 I think one of the guys was a little high at the time. But, you know. <laughs> That's what you get when you go to a board game cafe in Salem, Oregon, dude. <laughs> Never know what you're going to get is what you get. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next one is a, a legend on our podcast. It's been mentioned multiple times. Stronghold, second edition. Mm-hmm. And this this one for me is one of the like quotes. It's something that you repeat in your head over and over and over again in this game. Please don't <laughs> notice that. Please don't notice that. <laughs> I don't know. Like... Uh... It's just like constant because it's it's such a mind game, you know, and you're constantly really like, is. okay, I'm going to be subtle. I'm going to set up. I'm going to fake this way. And then I'm going to do this. Oh, I hope he doesn't notice. <laughs> Don't look over there. Don't. And the person, the other thing, a lot of times in this game, the other person talks out loud a lot about their thought process uh-huh. when they're like analyzing the situation about their final decisions yeah. to make. And so it's just like, yeah. It's I mean, stressful. it's hard not to. There's like so many things you're trying to keep in your head. Yeah. Yeah. If you're playing this game, and you have analysis paralysis. That's that, that's kind of tough. It's brutal. It's brutal. The game <laughs> well, it was just funny that you said that about just like please don't notice that. Please don't notice that. Because the first game that we played, it was like the final round. You were the defender. I was the attacker. And you had no, 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 no. I was the defender. You were the attacker. Yeah. And you had like made a mistake in your placement of something, and I noticed it, but I was like, oh. Okay, I see that, but <laughs> he must have had, he must have some plan. Like it's such an I obvious that. mistake that oh, what what is he doing? And I spent like twenty minutes just staring at the game before taking my turn. I remember because I was convinced that he had some master plan that I was going to miss. And it's, it's, you reach this point in the game where you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to spell everything out to you. Not because I'm expecting positive, like helpful <laughs> feedback, but because I just want to make sure all my thoughts are out here, you know? And you yeah, go through everything, you're like, out. okay, this has to be the right decision, right? And it's just like crickets <laughs> on the other side, and you're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what did, a great game. Did you what a great title game. it yet? Oh, yeah, we almost moved on. Mine is the knockoff Helm's Deep. <laughs> <laughs> there is the what uh, uh, might even be an official i don't know if it's official there's a helm's deep expansion but it might be fan made but, oh is there yeah okay that'd be sweet and i i mean that in the kindest way because i love helm's deep and i love this game but it's just kind of you know it's <laughs> means, pretty similar means the word knockoff in the kindest way yeah right. yeah you're the best knockoff there is all right and our final entry for our list is underwater cities mm-hmm. and this one is another it's another throwback for me um this one was not on the anniversary episode, so you really have to go back and find the episode. But um, let's just one word, all caps, domes. <laughs> I al- Okay, I almost did one that had domes in it, but yeah. I didn't. All right, what'd you do? Yeah, the, the domes are cool. Uh, mine, mine is more thematic for the game. Today's special, algae with a side of biomatter. <laughs> Because that's what that's what you're feeding all your cities. When you have to feed them, you feed them algae. Oh, that's. And if you don't have algae, you can spend biomatter to feed them. So this is what the people in this futuristic world are eating. You know what's funny? Like, I'm a very. I've talked about this before. That like I want the theme in a game to be good, but I don't care too much about the integration. 
I don't care necessarily about the thematic reasoning behind things too much. And I, I might mention it as cons sometimes when we do Game of the Weeks. But in general, as far as like how I like a game, that doesn't impact it too much. I had never even thought about why you paid seaweed for your cities. You know, I was just like, yeah, you just have it's like feeding your workers, I guess, whatever. Just pay your seaweed, you, just, you know. Give them some green stuff. They'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. yeah. But I, I never even thought about it as a feeding mechanism. I was just like, all right, you just have to pay your like taxes, whatever. It doesn't matter. I just have to pay seaweed. All right, fine. In algae. Yeah. So that's funny. That That is quite funny. That's kind of sad, but it's funny. Cody, that's like the story of like half the content on this podcast. So like man that's sad but it's, it's kind of funny at least it's still yeah. kind of funny that's what we're that's what we're here for dude we're here to take the the sad unfortunate droppings of the board game world and we we, we try to we try to dust them off what are you uh, we try to wash them <laughs> what are you we, talking we try, about <laughs> i'm like what are you droppings like what we, we try to make it funny it's like it's like those monkeys over in you know, East Asia, wherever they are, that they, they eat the coffee beans, then they poop the coffee beans, right? Oh, Kopi Luwak. And so, and so, and so now, yeah, so, so you've got you've got poop, but there's coffee beans in there. So it's like we're trying to take this unfortunate event that could have been averted, but what? for some reason people did on purpose, and we're trying to turn it into a good situation for everyone else. Are you still talking about board games? Like, are board games the unfortunate event that you're referring yeah. to? No, just it's, just, it's sometimes... sometimes Probably more often than not, in the board game world, people make a silly choice and they they package something. They they package a little coffee bean that could have been presented in a different way, but they package it in turds. And then we take that and we're like, how can we... Ah, I know. We can just trash this on our podcast and then it makes a bad thing into a good thing. Um, I don't want to agree because I feel like this could be a lawsuit at some point in the future, a defamation suit or something. So I'm, I'm, this be a lot. We're, we're not we're not defaming anyone specifically. I don't know. Maybe we are. Maybe you are. I'm like I feel I'm just confused as to why you're comparing board games to actual actual dung. So I just can't get on board, Kevin. I just can't get on board. Although I I have only, to say only the only the bad games. Only the bad games. That's pretty subjective, yeah. though. In yeah. some cases, it's not. But uh, okay. Um, I have to like we did it. This is a timely episode, man. Like, we haven't had a sub hour in, like, a long time. And I'm guessing yeah. we're not going to ramble about monkey poop for another eight minutes, so... Probably not. I mean, is there anything else we need to talk about? Like, here's the thing. Where where would you have put Scythe in your top five? For art? <laughs> <laughs> or, or would you have? <laughs> okay. If I had remembered Scythe before I moved yeah. the mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... Like, if we're just talking about what the actual art of the game looks like, it's either number number two or number one. Because, like, I still have a lot of respect for Dixit and just the creativity within the art. Hmm. But but Scythe is, does have spectacular art and world-building art, right? And so, yeah. number two, because I have so much respect for Dixit, or number one, but I still have a bunch of respect for Dixit. That's, hmm. that's my answer. Good enough for you, Cody. I mean, it kind of restores up feelings of outrage that you would have put it at one or two. <laughs> shove it down, Cody. Shove it down. But yeah, we, we already reinstated you. I, I spent like two hours writing that speech and coming up with the oath of office. So yeah, we'll just we'll call it good. Yeah. And you can't take away my membership until I do something else that apparently violates some universal law where I have no freedom to make well, my we'll own decisions. We'll have to take it up with the board. May, maybe, okay, maybe this is an executive power. That obviously I've just taken willy nilly. So maybe we'll just have to share this executive power. That if one of us ever willingly like betrays the gaming industry, e- even if it's unknowing, oh, you but mean then the you're, dung you're, you're producing not, industry, Cody? I'm sorry, using your words here. Hey, I'm not saying that's what the industry does explicitly or exclusively. I'm just saying, in in the same way that coffee exists and there's so much good coffee. But there's just some people that are like, we should feed this to monkeys and then let them poop it and then we'll do something with it. Like, that's that's the problem there. Oh, I'm starting to get lost again. Let's just not, let's just not go back. Honey. Let's just not. <laughs> anyway, anyway just leave okay. it. Maybe, maybe we can reserve this executive power to, to keep the other person responsible. I mean, sure. Like, I, I don't I don't know. We'll just we'll just have to see what the future holds, Cody, for yeah. such grievous errors. 
Or maybe we should have a revolution against the powers that have that power. I feel know. like th- I feel like this podcast is turning into a mostly board game podcast, but we're starting to weave like role playing in somehow. Like when mm. it started out and I was on trial, I was like, "What? Wait, are we are we back to also doing? <laughs> is this an RPG, RPG episodes? What is this? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Zimoyam <laughs> Zichim. Uh, well, we haven't said it in a while, so uh, if you enjoyed this content, wherever you're listening to it, like, subscribe, comment, follow. Hey, that comes that comes later. <sighs> and remember, the word Elvelin means absolutely nothing, according to Nate. It's true. Okay, can, can, can I talk now, Cody? Can I do my outro? Yeah, that, that's fine. Right. Well, here's the thing. I didn't want us to, like, start up the outro thing and then have nothing to say. Like, we gotta have something. All right, we have something. It's exactly what I was was going to say. Uh, okay. If you enjoyed this content, please like, subscribe, comment, follow, whatever the business is, whatever platform you're listening to it on. If you didn't like the content, please like, subscribe, comment, follow, whatever platform you're on. <laughs> yeah, do what you're supposed to do. Even so. Peace.